you lot too much for the final reporters for even sending us to our real site channels during the week to today, Friday, and planning us our lives also on what is it? Indeed, he has done, has built well with us, and we have to give him the praise, the glory, and the energy he deserves. Okay, let's go straight to our topic for today. I'm sure we all know the topic we are going to talk about. Can someone help us? What topic are we discussing today? Moving by discipleship. Moving by discipleship. Moving by discipleship. I mean, when you hear this topic, it's kind of a possessive something. It's not proving your discipleship, it's mine. So, even in mentioning the topic, you get to know that you are actually talking about yourself. You are possessing it. So I am proving my discipleship, right? Right? Okay. So as our brother Riley said, our topic for today is proving my discipleship. And once you even say proving my discipleship, it's like I come here and I say I want to prove that I am a student. And of course that means the first thing that must be certain or must be right is that I am actually a student, right? If I'm not a student, I can't prove that I'm a student. In the same way, if you are going to prove our discipleship or proving my discipleship, it certainly means that we are actually disciples. That is what we can infer from this. So if we are actually disciples, then what at all are disciples supposed to do that we as Christians want to prove? That is basically what I have to talk about today. I'm here to prove my discipleship, and if I want to prove it, then of course I'm a disciple. And what at all are disciples required to do to prove that discipleship? And that is what we are going to discuss here today. Now, the moment you hear proof, I'm sure, and we actually have heard it in a lot of times, we've used it in a lot of sentences, and we actually know what it means. Or well, let me also say what my brother said on Sunday. Back then, when we were in university, when we were students, we had something called a project defense, where you come to prove if actually you did the work. Is it so then? <laughs> okay. Well, it's still in existence because whatever work we do, whatever thing we do as students, we need a proof to show that it's true. You are trying to do it on your own. The same applies to our examinations. We need a proof. That is why we write the exam. If you study, how will I do you study? It's true your examinations are on. Therefore, proof is something that I mean we all use or we all do to know actually if what we are talking about is what it certainly is. Through the dictionary proof, I just searched through the dictionary to see what proof means. And I got proof simply means to prove something. It just means to demonstrate or use facts and evidences to show the existence of something. It can also mean to show that something is true by one's actions. So to show if something is actually true or not, we need a proof of it, right? It can be either something which is factual or something which is physical for us to see, or something that is done through someone's actions. That is how the dictionary. That is how the dictionary defines proof. And then we come to disciple because the topic is proving my discipleship. So what at all, or who at all is a disciple? A disciple is a follower. Some um, dictionaries use disciple as apprenticeship. You following someone. So the definition here I have is a, a disciple can be defined as a learner or a student who follows a master, philosopher, or a teacher. A disciple who possesses certain qualities or traits of his master, right? I'm not sure someone will want to follow someone and has the ulterior motive of not listening or not following the behavior the person is executing, the behavior the person is portraying. Of course, for you to even take the initiative to follow someone, you've seen some things in a person that the person has executed that you want to have or you want to learn, right? That is why you follow the person. The same applies for us Christians. Even as we're sitting I'm sure. We heard something, if we are not even baptized, we are still seeking to know more. That is why we are found ourselves here. Many people are in different places, as we stand now, on Friday, Friday night. A lot of things are going on outside, but we chose to come here to sit here and to worship God. That means we made a decision, right? So we've all made a decision to be what? Disciples of who? Of Christ. That is why we find ourselves here. But I've been throughout the Bible, the various instances where the mention of disciples was. About 274 times the word disciple was used in the Bible. Where we have disciples of John, disciples of Pharisees, of Moses, and we have disciples of Christ, which we are striving so hard to make sure that we meet that criteria, right? We want to be people who are true 
and set him an actual disciple of Christ. And if you want to actually be like Christ, then we possess the qualities that Christ gave to the kids here, that he has commanded us to do. I'm sure that is what we are all looking at and longing to have in the near future. So that when he comes the second time, we will be indeed good and righteous disciples of him. And the prize that is kept for us, or he has promised to us, he also gave to us. Now a disciple's first priority is following the master. And our master here is Christ, right? Everything else is secondary. If Christ tells him to do this, he does. If Christ tells him to do the other, he does the other. And that is the sole duty of a disciple. A disciple is someone who has agreed by all means to follow the dictates or the commands of the master. And that is what as Christians and as people who are disciples of Christ are doing as we are initiating here. Now today, of course, as disciples, there are a lot of commandments that Christ has given to us. But today we are going to center the command that we are going to use as Christians to prove ourselves, that we want to discuss, to love. And our text that we are going to base solely on, or mostly on, is from John chapter 13, verse number 34 and 35. So in John chapter 13, verse number 34, it reads, A new commandment I give unto you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. This is something that Christ gave to his people, his, comrades, his disciples, at a point in time when he was about dying. When you take a soul reading from John chapter 13, the whole chapter, we see Christ on this feast of Passover this evening sitting with his disciples and having a meal with them. Now, in this, he turns and says this to them that a new commandment I give. That you love one another as I have loved you. And he continues to say that by this, everyone will know that you are my disciples and love one another. Why then will Christ give this command to his people? Does it mean that prior to this commandment, there was nothing at all that his people knew, or nothing or no commandment that showed them to love each other? This is the first time Christ is bringing this to them. Even from the beginning of that verse, you get to see that no. Because it says, a new commandment I give to you. That you love one another as I love you. That you also love one another. If it's a new commandment that he had given to them, then of course, it certainly means there was an old one. There was something that was old. That's necessitated him to bring a new one. We are going to expose to see what actually, or what Christ meant by this. Now, in John chapter 13, in the verse number 34, 35, we get to see that the love that Christ was making mention of one here. It's something unique and something that he demands that all the disciples should possess, right? Because he said it is true this love that people will see that yes, they are disciples of him. It is an action that requires a great effort and choice. Love is something that we might find difficult in trying to possess or even trying to show to other people. And it's a choice there because you make a choice to do it or not. It's a command given by God. And as such, if an individual wants to in order to prove the person's discipleship, it depends on the person to make a choice to do so or not. That is why I was saying that many people have found themselves in various places but we are sitting here because we made a choice to prove our discipleship to Christ by being here to worship Him. Now from John chapter 13, uh, 13 in verse number 34 to 35, we get to understand that Christ is making the people or His disciples over there see the need or the reason why they have to love one another. He concludes in the 35 that it is through this loving of one another that people or those around are going to see that indeed they are his disciples. He talks about love here, not just something that I can just come and stand here and say, maybe I love you, Elisha. It doesn't just end at me telling him that. It demands an action. It demands an effort. Our love that we do have to show to each other is going to demand our time. It's going to demand our efforts, our money, and sometimes even all that we have. Because you might press on, you might try to, I mean, take your mind from different things, but it will be very difficult. But Christ gave them this command because he knows that they will be able to do it if they ask him for the strength that he needs to do that. This same command that we read of in John chapter 13, verse 34, was given to the people of Israel. Something similar was given to them. But as we continue, we see the reason why Christ was saying a new commandment and given. So in Leviticus chapter 19, verse number 18, I'll take a read. 
Let me take one shot at nineteen. Let me take number eight. No way, he got me in the middle of the evening. But shall love me back as yourself. I am alone. Shall love me back as yourself. Doesn't it want out to love you? Please, doesn't it? It does. Over here, God gave these people of Israel the command that they should love their neighbor as they love themselves. But Christ in John 13, verse number 34 35 says that they should love one another as he has loved them. There's a slight difference between these two. That is why he said, a new commandment I'm giving unto you, right? But through this um, lesson also, we are going to understand and see the difference between these two and see what as Christians and as disciples of Christ we are required to do. He said, the new commandment I give to you that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples if you have love one another. Now these two commands make us understand what they it brings to light, or it brings to our knowledge, it brings to our knowledge something that there's a difference between the two. The first difference we can see from this is that there's a new standard as to how as Christians we are supposed to love. Who we should love, which brings to mind a new object of our love. Because in the first command he says, love your neighbor as yourself. In the second command he says, a new commandment I give you that you love one another as I have loved you. Continues in the two, the second point or the second standard that we see being changed in these two commands is why at all should we love? It grants us or gives us a new motive of our love as Christians and as disciples of Christ. It also tells us how we should love. It shows us the measure of our love. At that time, in Leviticus chapter 19, verse 18, as we read, it says you should love your neighbor as what? As yourself. But you come to John chapter 13 and 34, verse 34, it says, Love one another as what? There's a difference, right? Because he's saying that love your neighbor as yourself to the Israelites. And to us as Christians, he's saying, love one another as I have loved you. How has Christ loved us? Just casting our mind back to your cross. See the suffering, the pain, the shame that he came to. And you're because of you and I. Because of our sins, because of things that we as human beings didn't do right. But this man came to this earth to die for us. That's the measure of the love that Christ had for us. And he's equating this measure of love to the same measure that as Christians we should love one another. Is it possible? Is it possible? Can we do so? Is it possible? Yes. Can we? Yes. Oh, please, let's, 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 let's answer each other. Can we do so? Yes. Of course, Christ will give a command that he knows that his children or his disciples can't fully. I'm not sure I'll come here and if I can't raise this thing. I'll tell everyone that if you are not able to raise, you can't be my disciple. I, of course, must be able to do that before the people following me are required to do the same thing. Christ showed this love to us, and as such, is requiring us as Christians to show the same love to each other or to one another. He teaches us that we are supposed to love one another. Let's go to the first point a new object of our love. There's a, there's a new object of our love, a new object that demands as Christians. To love one another. It doesn't say seclude some people that maybe love the selected few, love your neighbor, these people, they are the selected ones that you're supposed to love. Now we are to love one another. Where we are going to find ourselves with, by extension of what you told the disciples at that time, we are to love each other no matter how we find ourselves. Now, because of time, we will take the whole reading of John chapter 13. But from the 13 verse 1, Christ came into the room. With his disciples, when the feast set before them. And now, before they were about to eat, this man removed his garments, gathered himself with a towel, poured water into a basin, and started washing the feet of the disciples. Take for instance, we are here, we come to church, and preacher comes, just pours water into a basin and come. He starts washing everybody's feet. I'm sure many of us will resist it, right? It will be, it may be like, like, why is he doing that? Right? But this man, Christ, came and he was doing this. Now, Peter, he was going to ask him. He said, no, I won't allow you. And Christ told him that if you don't allow me, then of course, you can't be a part of me. Won't be a part of You can't be a part of my disciple if you don't allow me. And Peter said, eh, hey, I said, Peter. Peter said, what do you have to do with him? He said, to show that he's actually ready to be a disciple of Christ. Right? By then, we see what Peter did. We see what he did, right? Yes. Yeah. 
This is trying to make it understand that this man professing his love to us demands that we should also do sin. And this object of our love doesn't secure a sect of people that have to love this person and leave this person. No. We have to love each and every one. And through this love, we show other people that indeed we are disciples of Christ. Our love for each other must reflect the same kind of love that Christ showed to us. It is so important to Christ that He did this for us. Now, how many of us, knowing indeed that maybe a brother or a sister we are sitting with wants to kill us and we still show love to the person? Christ did the same thing. Christ did the same thing here. He washed the feet of Judas when he was washing all the disciples' feet. He washed his feet including all the eleven. I'm sure many of us would have maybe secreted that person or maybe in a few because. I mean, Christ knows everything, so of course he knew that Judas was going to betray him, right? Because when you read him in the chapter 30, he continues like saying, Judas, what you are supposed to do? Go and do it. He's ready for him. He knows what he's going to do. But the rest of us, they didn't know what Judas was going to do. Christ did it because of the sin that he knew Judas was going to commit to him. Prevent himself from washing the feet of Judas. If you cry, that was the first feet he even washed. We never know. It's just bringing us to the mind that. The object of our worship or our love as we say it is to everyone, no matter how we find ourselves, and even as Christians, which of course are more important. But the Bible is understand that we as Christians, we have to even love each other, like we have to bear each other's burdens so to fulfill the love of Christ. How do we bear each other's burdens if we don't love each other? That demands on the state that as Christians we should love one another. Now let's take a case study. Something small. Christ had 12 um, disciples and apostles, right? Simon, Peter, Andrew, James, Brother John, Philip, Thomas, Matthew, James, and the other James, Thaddeus, Simon, Judas, and Matthew. That Simon was Simon the Zealot. And then there was Matthew the tax collector today. These people, if we were maybe in the Jewish time, in those times, would have seen these two people as enemies. Because if you remember last year, we had a class, a brother Mahatma led us to. He made us understand who those Zealots were. There were people who were so opposed to the Roman, the Roman rule that they didn't want Romans to have dominion over them. They were Jews. And these tax collectors too were Jews, but they were working with the Romans to take tax from the Jews. You understand? Say maybe I'm here with you. Hey, you know, you're right? Maybe a leader somewhere is ruling over us. And me that I'm with you here, I'm also taking your funds and giving it to the person. And I'm not taking only that. I'm also taking more and I'm keeping the rest for myself. Because these tax collectors were not paid. But they were exploiting the people to get money for themselves and to get money for the Romans also. These two people, Simon the Zealot and Matthew the tax collector, were in the same room when Christ was saying that love one another. These two people, from the different sects they found themselves, this man being a tax collector, this man being a zealot, were so opposed to each other. But in this same instance, Christ is admonishing the two of them. To love each other, to show love to one another, no matter the circumstance that you found yourself in. It applies to us too. Probably you've had relations with other people. Probably someone sitting by you. Probably something that the person is not even aware of. But Christ is commanding us to do that. No matter the circumstance, no matter the past we have, no matter what we are facing today, we have to show love to one another, improving our discipleship to each other. Something small about the zealots, if we have read the last one on this day, they were red hot patriots, ready to die in any instant for what they believed in. And these tax collectors, too, like Matthew, they were assigned by the Roman government to collect tax from the Jews. And they were expected to take extra money because the Romans were not going to pay them. So your own brother is doing this to you, and Christ is saying that I should love the person. There's no limit to this love of Christ, as I was saying earlier. This man, with no sin, had to come to this end, to take up our shame, to take up the pain that we had caused ourselves, and come and die for our sins. Isn't this something that, like, I mean, as individuals, we should even cherish so much? And if this man had given us this command to love one another, I think there's no excuse for us to say we will not be able to do that, or we won't do that. Let's move straight to the second motive also. The second is, there's a new measure of our love. That measure said, you have to love you have to love your neighbor as yourself. It doesn't apply to us. That measure doesn't apply to us as Christians. 
Because the measure that we have is that we have to love each other as Christ has loved us. See those times maybe if we were there, be like the way I love myself, I have to love you the same way. It's a make up in the dia, it's me. We post we are almost right. That's how it will be. Because if I love myself to this measure, you can't go above my measure. You can't go above the way I love myself. So those times if I post myself and I write self-love, I'll do the same thing for you. If I don't do that, I won't do it for you. I don't know if you get what I'm trying to say. It's the same as was applied to these people of the Israelites. But Christ is making us understand that. That is not so what. Our measure is that we have to love each other as he has loved us. It's far greater than the love that the Israelites possess or they express to each other. And therefore, we have no excuse. There's no excuse if we are not able to do this. Because the command gave it to us from God. Another thing also that I mean we are able to understand. Another thing that we are able to understand also that in this measure of our love to each other, as Christ demands us to, we have to love enough to serve one another. The service that Christ portrayed to these people, these disciples, that after he asks that they love one another, is what as Christians we are supposed to First Corinthians 14, chapter 13, sorry, verse number 4. Please understand that. Love should it be popular. We should be so humble in our love that I mean people may look down on you in you professing your love to other people. But the Bible demands that we should do so. We should love enough to serve one another. A leader is a servant, and if we want to be disciples of Christ as he leads us, we must also serve. From our devotions within the semester, I'm sure we've already touched on James chapter 2, verse number 1 to 4, where we are to love without partiality. The same as we spoke of concerning Simon and Zealot and Matthew the Tax Collector. There's no partiality. Simon didn't come and say that because Peter and the rest are Jews like me, I will love them more than I love Matthew the Tax Collector. That is not the case in any way for other species. Our love for each other is a measure of the love that Christ has for us. And as such, it doesn't limit itself to various things or people or maybe instances that we find ourselves because people have been good to us. It doesn't end it. And our love for each other shouldn't be with an ulterior motive that I'm loving this person because of something I'm getting in return. Christ loved us and came to die for us, expecting nothing from us, right? Right? He came to die for our sins. Because he had done nothing. And if as Christians we are being commanded to do the same, of course we have no excuse if we don't do that. We have to love enough to suffer. You know that we really need to decide to be in a plan you can go through with those. Over here, Paul was so much in pain because of the love he had for the church in Corinth. The church in Corinth. He said that Corinthians was 12 verse 15. This man argues that, yes, indeed, he has gone through so much pain because of the love he had for the In the verse, chapter 11, verse 23 to 30, he had been beaten so many times, he had gone through a lot of affliction, a lot of pain because of the love that he had for this people. His love for them resulted in him thinking about their salvation. And in doing this, he said, no, nothing is going to stop you from coming to them, from preaching to them, from doing what God commands you to do. And that is what our brother Paul went through in showing his love. So if Paul even went through this, how much more we as Christians, we people who want to follow this man Christ, this God, that's why that we want to also be part of or be disciples of we must love enough to forgive. Love forgives and endures all things. First Corinthians 13. The verse 1 coming down to the 13. Please understand a lot of things about love. Love is defined solely and rightly over here. That as we say, if we want to, we come to church in one way or the other, someone fought against you, someone does something that you don't like. And because it has hurt you so much, you think, no, you can never forgive the person. You can never love the person anymore. But the Bible needs to understand here that love. It's something that we must possess so much enough that we can forgive each other. Take for instance Christ saying that no, he has loved us too much. Say the one five body chain. I'm not sure who is sitting here. Probably we all have died. But this measure that we are looking at, which is the love of Christ for us, which we have to have for other people or brethren, demands that we forgive each other, no matter the circumstance we find ourselves. The next is, there's a new motive for our love as Christians now. 
our love as Christians demands a motive. Over here he says that in the 35, that through our love, all who know that or see our love as we possess to other people, who know that yeah, these are disciples. All who know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. So if you don't have love for one another, then of course, people around us will not even see or will not even testify that these people are disciples of Christ. In Acts 17, verse number 21, the people of old, the early Christians, they were doing something. Once in Antioch, they found themselves among other people, the Gentiles and people who really didn't believe in God. But because of their acts, because of the things that they did, the people started calling them Christians because no, they were like these people are exhibiting traits, they are exhibiting things that prove or shows Christ behavior when he was on this earth. If they are doing the same, then of course they are Christ like, they are disciples of Christ. That was when they started calling them Christians. That is the first instance we hear people of God called Christians. In Acts 17, verse 21. The motive of our love should be to demonstrate God's love to all the people we find ourselves around. If you are sitting with a brother, if maybe you find yourself with an individual, a member, even someone outside, a motive that we should use to love shouldn't be because of something that will gain your return, because of the money that will get the favor, or because you want to impress people. No, that shouldn't be our motive. The Bible doesn't teach us such. Our motive as Christians is to love each other that people may see us and know that yes, indeed, these people are people of Christ. And these people are people that must be. I mean, following Christ, that show that indeed they are disciples of Christ. Let people see us and know that indeed we are people of Christ. We are disciples of Christ. That is what the Bible refers to us from John chapter 10 to the verse number 34 to 35. Now, in showing this motive, of course, I'm not sure we can just stand up and start showing love to each other. It won't just be something that, I mean, we'll find easy. But the Bible makes us understand that since the command in the act of God is going to help us in that regard. We find it so difficult to do so. And the church, seeing the need of it, we come together as Christians to praise God, to worship God. We also organize a lot of programs to help us socialize with each other, to help us meet each other and get to know ourselves. To help someone, of course, you have to know the problem of the person. If I don't know your problem, how will I help you? I can think so much for you and do something that maybe doesn't require this um, um, judgment or this thing I'm looking for you. Probably you need a book. I come to you and I give you a pen. It will be of no use to you, right? It will be of no use to you. But in trying as much as possible to show our love to each other, a lot of things the church puts in place to help us in that regard. We've had a lot of programs from the beginning of the semester to this time. And there are a lot also, even after this week's semester. The main one which we are all anticipating is our friends with And then the socializing. Our socializing is a point where we place where as Christians and even as people here on campus, we come together. Even before we get there, because of the excitement that comes around us, we lay off all our burdens and we come there to fellowship with one another. We come where we have a lot of games, a lot of programs, things that even as we identify ourselves, we get to know each other and interact with each other. Maybe you've not spoken to me before, maybe I've not even seen you before, you've not contacted me before, but that's venue provides an avenue where we as Christians come together and even in our socializing, we get to know each other and get to even show love to one another. As we began, I made us understand that the love that the Bible is speaking of is not something that we just say and it just ends there. Christ loves us indeed and to show this love to the disciples, he had to watch them, to show how hungry he was, how he was going to serve them because of the love he had for them. This program is also coming up and the church has planned on the 16th of March. It is something that we are all supposed to involve ourselves in. This is a point where we come together as we fellowship with one another, we get to interact with each other also. Sometimes it is true that things that you get to know the benefits of things that are facing other people. It is even true this meal that Christ had with the disciples that they want to show or press love to each other. That was a point where Christ was so emotional that he used the phrase little children. He was speaking to the disciples and told them, little children, the new commandment I give unto you, and you love one another, is something that, I mean, he has not really said anywhere in the Bible, except John using it in version. This man was so emotional, like a man who is about to die, because he knew that he was about to die. Christ, who had come in the form of man, in his last days, through all his emotion, professes to the people, that yes, indeed, even as he's about to die, this last goal of him, that we love each other as he loved us, something that he requires of us as Christians. Love is a bond 
of perfection. It's a bond of perfection. It's something that as Christians we have, in as much as we do, have it in our lives. Because without love, we can't see God. Without love, we are not even of Christ. Right? But what then is there for one who even fails to show this love or to do discipleship? The Bible makes us understand that, yes, indeed, through the various laws that maybe we face, the obstacles that we come to, we might we will be able to overcome them if as Christians we make it our mind to do so. Christ has shown us so much love that even though we do not deserve it, He came to that for us. And if we don't prove this discipleship to Christ, then of course that means we are not His disciples. Because we understood that a disciple is someone who has made up his mind to follow a master. So if you want to follow the master and you don't do things that the master has done, then of course you are not his follower. Put in the boots again. It's like you are just okay, you do baby, and then you stop, then you follow, then you stop and follow. You are not a Christian. You are just a follower. Like you are just with us. All the blessings that comes with us being disciples of Christ and being Christians, of course, you are not going to receive. This love that we are talking about also, if we fail to do this, of course, we get to understand that we don't have the love of Christ abiding in us. Because if we don't show love to each other, then we are actually dead. In first John chapter 3, verse number 14 to 15, take that read. He who does not love, does not show love to his brother, abides in death and has no eternal life. The blessings that come with us following Christ or doing things as he has commanded us to, and as he did, is that as we do so, the blessings that come with it, he bestowed on us. And the eternal blessing that he has provided or he has promised us is eternal life. So if we are not going to do the things that he commands us to do, how can we get this eternal life that he has promised us to do? So many ways we come together as Christians, we socialize with each other. And the church is a safe space where, as Christians or even as people, you should find a lot of your friends, a lot of people that you find yourself with. I don't know, but for me, a lot of my university life, a lot of my friends, a lot of the people I know are from church. If not church, nowhere else. The love that Christ has asked or entitled as Christians to possess is something that we can't do away with. See how nice the streets are. But when you come to church, you close and then you just leave. Indeed, it's very difficult, but our socializing with each other, the more we bond with each other, the more we get to know the meaning of this love that Christ demands us to show the more we get to understand that if we don't execute the tax that Christ has promised us, we won't receive the blessing that demands or the blessing that comes with it. Love that we have possessed for each other. Christ showing his love to the disciples, of course, it didn't come that easy. These people who even rejected that, no, Christ, I won't allow you to, I won't do it. It's the same way. Even a family meeting, our brother was saying, you go and you talk to someone, and the person will be like, you are interviewing the person. What's your name? The person just will be like, it will be very difficult. But it's a command. And bear in mind, we are not all the same level of faith. We are trying as much as possible to understand the word of God and build ourselves up. So if someone offends you, that is why love forgives. First Corinthians 13, verse number 4. Love forgives. Love doesn't hold record of past things or sins that someone has committed to you. We come together as Christians and we close that maybe because you don't know anyone, because you don't want to have fellowship, because you don't see it fit, because someone has done something wrong to you. You just leave. Or you hold a grudge within you. If Christ had a grudge within his heart for Judas, who had betrayed him, you think he would even have washed his feet? And that Judas, that time now he could die, Christ would have killed him and died that. But that is not what he did. Because love forgives, if we are going to possess this love that the Bible demands us to, as we say, we must learn to forgive each other. Our socializing, all things that we do, should be godly and things that indeed show the love of Christ in our life. Continue to work here. See the last the picture of the fire. Just a game that Christians had together. See how happy and excited they are. See, or the sword drill. Now, in looking for the passage, you see the way they are so excited. The love that we have here as Christians, the love that we are asked or attacked as Christ, from Christ to show to one another is one that is, is unimaginable. It has no expanse, as we go to understand. The measure is so great that it should be even. More than that of the Israelites. Our measure right now is the love that Christ has for us. Do we love each other so much that even through our pain, even through our suffering, even if you have only bread once a week, you are going to give the person to take it to Even if there's bread once a week, 
it is so difficult, it's so hard, it's so, I mean, it's something that, I mean, we find so difficult. Me standing here, I'm also trying my best to be a disciple of Christ. I might not find things so rosy, like, so free, so nice. Sometimes you find it difficult to be communicating with people. But all these programs, all these things are laid down for us as we say, to have fellowship with one another. See how nice these people are in these pictures. See how the like the last day, the last picture that I find, the football match, VR, yeah, they are checking the video to see if it was actually upside. A lot of things that we come together as Christians, and even in, in showing this last picture that we get to meet, we get to know one another. And if it is in this lab that you get to know that if you are way or pay with, this person likes this, this person doesn't like this. So that if a two says she doesn't like this, you don't know what a two says she doesn't like. You get it. There are a lot of things that are species. If we come together and we have this bond, this love with us, we are going to eat, reap the blessings that Christ has for us. Over here, you see a team. This was my 2023 year, year last year. We lost two, but we had a whole shallow in our list. And Emmanuel. And our star player, Obed, is that A lot of fun that we have in Christ. This measure of love goes beyond that. That may be the world we see, people outside we see. And it's through this love that we possess for each other. There are people outside we see and know that he has people, These people are people of Christ. Sometimes, I don't know if I miss you. They'll be like, hey, Sunday, they are your cozy pictures. In the church, they are equal, you are free, or you know people. Sometimes, maybe because of that, you invite someone to pray for the person who come. Home brand, when I say, hey, we'll check them, remember, the person will come. This love that we show to one another is so important to Christ. And he knew that, of course, this love is going to push us to do things that will bring people to the food. That is why he says that it is true, this love, that people will see and know that, yes, indeed, we are disciples of Christ. A lot of pictures over here. A lot of pictures. As the lighting activities where we express we show love to each other. You see our brother will be there. Seven people. Seven people. You see, love saves. From the, the, the points that we raised over there, love is so humble to say. See this man, metallurgical engineer, <laughs> having a chef cut one day, with a train going to save someone. Is it not because of the love he has for the person? Of course. The love that we possess as Christians should be so important to us that we will lay off anything before we want to show love to one another. Right? See how our, our brother is over there. If you are not in but still, even if you have to take one spoon, we will take it together to show that yes, we have love for each other. A lot of things that bring us together. Food brings us together, our fellowship, Bible study, and all that. But at this point, as the church is planning to have a socializing, I will urge that if you made up your mind not to join, please join. Right? If you made up your mind not to join, please join. And as we bring together our foods, our drinks, and all that we have, our friends, which is, I mean, this is going to be within the French week. We are also tasked to invite our friends, and as we invite our friends, we bring more words, more words, more, words, more food. Because of course, if you are going to have fellowship, a person will be able to say, I came and you didn't give food. But love forgives if you come and you don't give food. Love forgives. You understand? <laughs> but as much as possible, we come together with more food. Of course, we are going to enjoy it. And the love that depends only that we have pieces, which every year engineering weeks, which are going to win again. We have a lot of games. Where we get to meet each other, we get to see each other. You see Peter playing his draft. Now he's going to play football. A lot of things are going to happen. We have a retailers, we have beer around over there. Many people. And that is where as Christians we create a safe space for ourselves. Coming together to show love to each other. It doesn't end just there at social life. It continues in a lot of things, a lot of ways. This week we had our brotherly checkup. I don't know if any of us have really called checkup. I actually made up my mind that I'm going to call everyone, but it's me to me. Because we are mean. Time to go to the anamnes before it doesn't go through. But I will try my possible best to even not beat or half hour. Or maybe just one zoo and I will finish that zoo. Try as much as possible. You checking up on the person might even bring you to your, to your knowledge what the person is actually facing. We will have our a lot of things are going on. But the person can't, I mean, just come out and tell you that. If I'm in your I can't tell you that. It's just like that. Sometimes you communicate with the person. That creates that level ground for the person to come to. I really believe that Christ washing the feet of his apostle, this disciple, was to create a safe space where they will get to like be on the same level. Not the same level as like human beings and God being on the same level. No, no, I don't mean that. But for them to communicate with him and share the truth and whatever they were facing. And it was even through this that Christ went to them and told them that yes, indeed. Even as he's about to go, he wants them to have this new commandment that they love one another just as he has loved them. 
And through this, they may indeed know that they are disciples of people outside may know that they are disciples of Christ. I tried so hard to take this guy, the minister out of the picture. But I couldn't. Every picture me I went to see the boy is inside. Every picture, the minister is fast. Why? Because this boy makes up his mind, say, he has made up his mind, say, no matter the picture, he will be inside. No matter the form of gathering, he will be there. Why don't we all do that? Why don't we all involve ourselves in whatever program? You know, let's take away anything of shyness. If Christ was our boy, and he be our fairy, and he would die for us. If Christ came and he was shy, we would die for us. And the conscious man is why our person be attending. But that's not the case. Love bodies us. Love makes us take the first step. You might think they be a, they be a way to hear me. I mean, I don't want to be, sorry to use that word, but I don't want to be someone who's always looked down upon. But sometimes that is what, or that is how you even bring to the realization of someone that what the person is doing is wrong. Sometimes I saw a meme somewhere that people think we don't think. People think people don't think, right? Or be you, if someone is doing something, consciously the person is doing it. The person thinks you are not aware of it, but you know that the person is doing it, and when you will need, when you will need And the person is still doing it to you. Sometimes the person might even just pause and get to know that. What I'm doing to this person? I mean, this person has shown so much love to me because what I'm doing to the person shouldn't be, this shouldn't be the reply the person is giving to me. But the person is doing that. And sometimes the person respects you so much, but you don't know. Because that is the problem of the person. But as Christians, no matter where we find ourselves, in whatever situation we find ourselves, let us try as much as possible to show love to one another throughout whatever problems we face. That is why we are a family. That is why we have family meetings. That is why we come together to share our awareness, to share whatever problems we have. And we resolve them. We don't keep them to heart. I'll be so glad if we all take the reading, John chapter 13, the whole chapter, and also 1 Corinthians chapter 13, the whole thing. They are all 13, 13. The whole thing. And the book of First John, read the whole thing. It's just about love. And the love that Christ had for us. If we are able to activate this love, of course, it demands us to follow all the commandments that he gave us. Because he says, if you love me, you do what? You keep my commandments. And if I'm going to love my fellow brother, I can't love my brother without loving God. It is through the love of God that I measure my love, I give to my fellow brother or sister. So if I love God, I will love my fellow brethren. And if I love my fellow brethren, I'm going to obey the commandments of God. And all the commandments of God will all revolve around this love that we have for each other. It doesn't end only as realizing services, Sunday services, all the services that we have, whatever program that the church is going to put for us as Christians to build ourselves and identify ourselves, both socially, both spiritually, both psychologically, whatever it may be, I rather choose to be with the church in whatever program it has than to go to faculty or, I don't even remember, I don't even think I went for any uh, faculty or, I, I don't think I remember it. But if it's a church, it's my priority, because as we began, we want to know that the followers' priorities follow the master. The followers' priority is follow the master. If the master goes this way, I follow this way. The master does this, I do this. And since it's my priority, whatever may conflict or whatever may come as a barrier between me and my master, I have to cut it down. I have to move it. Because he prevents my love to one another and to my own. There shouldn't be any barrier between me and the Lord or the Christ that I've said. And this barrier, since I'm breaking it, is going to help me to love one another as Christ has loved me. Let's just conclude so our time is fast Let us not love in word or in time, but rather in deed and truth. Being a disciple of Christ does not end just by professing our discipleship. In professing it, we prove it. That is why in defining proof, we got to know that it is something that, I mean, it's based on facts, it's based on actions. You can't just come and stand here and say, we are a disciple. Okay, that's all. It is through the works and the things that you do that will merit this discipleship. That will show people around you that yet. This person is a disciple of Christ. Right? We must gladly bear the cost that comes with it. As I said, it's going to cost us our money, our time. It's going to cost us even, I mean, our strength. Coming here to even help pack the place, pack the chairs, cooking for people to eat. Sometimes it's going to cost us almost everything. But the Bible makes us understand that whatever we lose for the sake of Christ, we are going to gain. And our gain of it is going to be in multiple products. You might even never merit that Christ will do that to us. By an unbreakable chain. Someone, I think, someone told me I like chain. Everything I do, I exchange it. 
it's, it's because it never ends, it continues, it goes on and on. But when I wake up with you, our love for God is tied to and it's verified by our love, our love for one another. Our love for one another is tied to the love that we have for God. If we love God, it continues with our love for one another. It doesn't end there, it continues on and on and on. And it goes on to the total. That is why the love that Christ has commanded his disciples to have for each other. We still find ourselves here and we still possess that love to each other as Christians. Discipleship is more than a promised loyalty. It is rather prominently a practice loyalty. My loyalty to my master is something that I must, I must practice. It's not something that I must just confess. If it is important to me and I really give it fit and I esteem it, I will show it in my words, I will show it in my deeds. I will walk around with the banner of Christ on me, with the love that I am professing to each and every one I find myself with. Whatever brethren I am able to help, I will do so in that regard. If I can be of help in any way, I will not hesitate. What are you doing as Christians? What are you doing as people? To prove your love or to prove your discipleship to God. We've got to understand that yes, we are proving our discipleship to God. And if you are proving this discipleship, it demands that we first become disciples. If you are not a disciple of Christ, I don't know how you are going to prove the discipleship. But if you are a Christian, you made up your mind to follow Christ, to be a disciple of Him, you must prove the discipleship in whatever way, wherever we find ourselves. Because if we don't do so, we break that command or we go against this command for us that as Christians we have to love each other, that people around us see us and know that indeed we are disciples of Christ. If you haven't made up your mind to do so, my brother, my sister, I'm praying that you do so. And make sure that you prove the love of Christ and you prove your discipleship to me in whatever way you find yourself. In whatever program the church brings up for us to even have fellowship with each other, you make sure that it's your priority. You make sure that you are there, and you are there fully prepared. If you are there with your food, if it's drinks, you are there with your drink. Even if not, cry, when you come, there will be food, there will be drink. God be so good. People will show their love. And with that love that we show with each other, for each other, you get to know that indeed, we are actually proving this discipleship that the Bible means.